our next speaker has been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for 13 years. Everyone, please welcome Ayanti. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Ayanti. I'm currently a data analyst at 1-800-Flowers. But today, I'm going to talk about how to create accurate and beautiful maps in R. So just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. We'll talk about me. We'll talk about um, geospatial data overall, how to use it in R, um, and some resources, some geospatial resources for you guys. So what do I, a data analyst at 1-800-Flowers, have to say about geospatial data? Um, so for eight years, I worked at the intersection, pun intended, at transportation and data at two different New York City agencies. Um, I'm taking a break from city planning as a career, but I'm still really interested in geospatial data and maps. Um, I mapped all the TLC vehicle trips in the city. I worked with car crash data, so I'm very familiar with geospatial data. Also, my interest in maps comes from the fact that my family is from a place that is frequently left off maps. Uh, my family is from Sri Lanka, that little island south of India. And there's even a subreddit called um, Maps Without Sri Lanka. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, small plug, I'm on the board of the New York City chapter of Our Ladies. Um, highly encourage um, all women and gender minorities to join our meetup. Um, feel free to talk, talk with me about that after this. Um, so, geography is one of the oldest sciences. Um, a map is probably the first data visualization you ever saw or interacted with. They're in childhood puzzles, they're in probably every classroom in America, there's one in your pocket if you have Google Maps, um, they're in tons of TV shows, Dora the Explorer, anyone. Um, so, to this point, um, geospatial is one of the oldest forms of science, you know, finding the curve of the Earth, maps in the age of exploration, and in the modern world, it's becoming even more popular. You know, citing for land uses, you know, deciding where to put schools, farms, retails, et cetera. Uh, space exploration, military operations, population patterns using census data, dystopian surveillance, everything. GIS data is used for everything. Um, so some terms um, that are commonly tossed around, but unless you studied a GIS you might not be familiar with. So GIS just stands for a Geographic Information System. So that is an all-in-one framework for gathering, managing, and analyzing data. For the longest time, this was done with traditional and frankly clunky GIS software with a very expensive license. Um, and the good thing, it was all-in-one, point and click. Um, but the good thing about R is that it's free. So you can do all of this work um, much more quickly and for free. Cartography is just the science or practice of drawing maps. Um, and you may have heard the word shapefile. Um, so that is where geographic data has been traditionally stored, um, vector data specifically. We'll talk about what vector data is later. And vector data largely represents um, points, lines, and polygons. And it contains the location information and all the attributes of that geospatial point, line, or polygon. And as GIS becomes more open source, other formats are becoming more popular. You may have heard of GeoPackage, GeoJSON, KMLs. Um, and even like you can take a CSV with um, lat long and pull it in R and manipulate it so that you can project it onto a map. Now, um, vector data versus raster data. Unless you're in environmental science, you'll probably be mainly working with vector data, which points, lines, and polygons. And each type needs to be stored separately. So points and lines cannot be in the same file. Raster data, I don't want to get too in depth, but it's basically a digital image where each pixel represents a value. Um, so the two examples up here are of elevation and land cover. You take um, these images from high up, and each pixel is given a value based on the elevation or the land use. And when you're creating a map, there's a lot of different layers that need to come together to make your map. And different types of data are represented in different layers. And each layer is going to have two attributes, the spatial and the non-spatial attributes. So spatial is um, the latitude and longitude, the location information, and then the non-spatial information. You know, So if you have a census tract, you'll have the lat long for that. But then you'll also have you know, maybe the population, number of people under 18, Things like that. And this is a very important concept that um, a lot of data scientists don't really know because, again, if you didn't have like a city planning or geography academic background, it's not really taught, but it's really important. 
So a map is a visual representation of reality, and it's just always going to be distorted. Because at the end of the day, you're taking a small slice of the globe and flattening it to create a map. So the way I like to explain this is that think about peeling an orange um, and how different that piece of the peel looks when you flatten it out, depending on where you start it. And the peel, the size of the peel, you can peel it in a million different ways. And uh, the geographic coordinate system describes where the location is on Earth relative to the equator of the prime meridian. So since the Earth is round, sorry, flat earthers, um, <laughs> this is measured in angular units, usually degrees. And a projected coordinate system is a geographic coordinate reference system that has been flattened. Um, so when using a projected coordinate system, that flattened part of the Earth, you can measure distances using a straight line. And I'm not going to go too much into the text here, but I'm just going to show you some of the different ways the globe slash orange can be sliced. So you see um, where the conic projection, it's because you're taking that like area where the cone touches the Earth and you're flattening it out. And since a cone is wider than it's tall, the map will become more distorted as you move north or south of the standard parallel. Cylindrical projection, um, this is used often for world maps. Imagine just taking like a strip around the center and taking that portion of the Earth. Planar projection, this is the most common if you're say, doing, say, like a map of New York or a very small specific area. Um, imagine just um, taking like a piece of paper tangent to the globe and where it touches the globe. That's the part of the Earth you're taking. So some best practices in uh, visualizing geospatial data. First of all, who is your audience? Um, I think a lot of New Yorkers especially assume that everyone has the knowledge of New York that they do. Some people might not know what you mean when they say the five boroughs. So how to best um, explain and describe things? Um, always normalize your data. Um, because of things like unequal geographic boundaries, areas, and populations, it can make the data seem concentrated when it's really just a representation of population density. Um, one thing I see in a lot of maps is overlabeling. Keep labels to a minimum. Overlabeling makes it hard to read and overwhelming. I've seen a bunch of maps where every street is labeled, and that's just too much. Um, it's overwhelming for the reader. And think critically about your color palette. Um, so does your organization have its own color palette, um, accounting for color blindness or other visual disabilities, and uh, industry standard. So when I was working in city planning, you have the LBCS color codes for different land uses. So residential is always uh, yellow, industrial is gray, things like that. And then document all changes to the source data. One thing I like about working with geospatial data in R is that you can pull in this shape file into your working environment in R and manipulate it and keep it in your working, um, keep it in the IDE without um, editing the original file. But make sure you document all the changes. You may be joining shape files to census data. So keep in mind how you document all your changes. So I pulled this example of a map because um, I think it's extremely well done. And it really showcases all the really important visual map elements. So this is from the New Jersey Bike Pet Organization. And this is a map of Jersey City's land use in 2012. So it has all the essential elements, which are the map itself, um, very clear legend, uh, title, and data sources. Please always put your data sources, um, especially for things like the census, where these tables change over time. It's really important to have the source and when you pulled it. Um, some optional things, they're more common in traditional maps like this, um, but you have your north arrow, scale bar, and labels. Um, in my experience, scale bars are especially important for smaller maps because you don't always have the best idea of distance. Um, yeah, north arrow, scale bar, labels. So now we have all this data, we have all this information, so what do we do with it? We can use any combination of this data to make a good map using too much data or the wrong type of data will ruin a map. Um, and the following slides contain examples of bad or misleading maps or cartography practices. So this, nightmare, huge headache. <laughs> Please don't make a map like this. Um, like every state has a different logo that fills up the entire state, the entire East Coast, like everything's in the Atlantic Ocean. This is just a lot. Please don't do this. It's good for a BuzzFeed article, I guess, but nothing else. 
Um, and just a reminder that sometimes you, don't, you haven't really found a geospatial pattern, it's just a population map. Um, a bunch of my GIS friends sent me this cartoon and I just like, I, like, I have to put it in this presentation because it's so true. Um, misleading election maps, I see these every year. Um, this is always like a quote unquote own the libs maps because of all the red. Um, but in reality, like a lot of these areas are not densely populated. So it makes you think like, oh, everyone voted red. We should have a Republican president. But no, it's just, it's just like a population density map. Um, and to the New York Times' point, I have the source at the bottom. They say this is a misleading map. Um, this is just bad. Blue is there twice in the legend. It's like the colors are months and no stay at home orders. Every single state is labeled. I got like a huge headache when I saw this map. Please don't ever do this. <laughs> and I'm gonna bring up my personal beef with zip codes. Um, so zip codes are a terrible geographic boundary to use. And I broke one of my rules in over labeling, but I had to do it here. So this is a close up of Midtown and downtown Manhattan. So you'll notice there's a ton of zip codes in this like area of just a couple neighborhoods. And for example, the Empire State has its own zip code. So you shouldn't really be using these boundaries because frankly, they're not based on anything except for mail routes. Um, it's better to use things like census tracts or block groups, neighborhood boundaries, things like that. But please don't use zip codes if you can help it. Um, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about some R packages used to make maps. Uh, Packages for manipulating spatial data. This is an incomplete list. The ones on the left are the ones I use the most. The ones on the right, um, I've used a little bit but aren't as familiar with. I would say the main one to use is SF. Um, that's the one you use to bring in this data and manipulate it, um, doing spatial joins and various spatial functions. ggplot2 is great for static maps. Um, Leaflet is the best for uh, dynamic visualizations that I found. Um, but yeah, feel free to look into all of these. There's a ton of documentation on all of them, especially SF. So I'm gonna show you now some maps that have been made in R. Not to flex, but I made these maps. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think this is, um, I put them up here today because I think this is a good example of how you can use the same data to get two different answers. So if you look on the, the one on the left with the gradient, it looks like Wow, the East Village opened a million restaurants in March 2022. Um, but if you look on the right, where I've bucketed into quintiles, you'll see, oh, like, it's really just the East Village probably had an outlier. But in the top bucket, um, you have a lot of Manhattan, North Brooklyn, and Western Queens. So I think this is a better way on the right, personally, to visualize the data. I'm sure there are better ways, but I thought this was a good example of showing the data in two different ways can give you two different answers. This, um, this is using OpenStreetMap data, this guy Milos Popovich, and he makes these incredibly stunning maps in R. Um, his website is there. Highly suggest you check it out for not only his visualizations, but he has some good tutorials on there. This, like my jaw dropped when I saw this. I didn't know you could make relief maps like this in R, but this is using the Ratiator package. I found it on Twitter. Um, the title is beautiful. He has the source at the bottom, the package he used. And it's just like, I really didn't think you could make this in R until I saw it. These are two GIFs I made. Um, these represent a day's worth of New Jersey transit and New York City subway trips. So public transit agencies released this data called GTFS data. Um, so it gives you the public transit schedule. So this, assuming the trains run on time, LOL, this is um, <laughs> the movement of trains throughout the day. So it's a time lapse and you can see it slows down after rush hour and picks up during the morning. And um, these are the resources that I found most useful. Um, how to lie with maps, I think, Especially if you're like a data scientist transitioning to work with geospatial stuff, it's a fantastic introduction. Geocomputation in R, it's free online. Um, those three authors regularly contribute to the R geospatial ecosystem, um, and they're pretty active on Twitter too if you have questions, which is cool. And then I just have a list there of geospatial professionals with educational content. They post a lot on Twitter, for those who still use it, um, and even on LinkedIn. 
they will post visualizations and instructionals, so super useful. And then I'm always gonna shout out the New York City Open Data Portal. Um, there's a ton of geospatial data sets to get you started with analysis. I used to clean some of that data before it went on the Open Data Portal, so you're welcome. <laughs> and um, thank you everyone for listening. Um, that's a very famous map, but I don't know the projection um, of Vogsmead, so sorry about that. Um, and I have my GitHub at the bottom. Uh, feel free to talk with me about geospatial stuff after this is over. Um, I love talking about GIS. Please, um, anything GIS R is related, I'm here. Um, so thank you everyone for listening to me today, and I hope you got a little something out of this. <laughs>